Hello everyone and welcome to this new event of SCALE. My name is Massimo Mazza, I'm a senior partner and I lead uh, Fuel by McKinsey. Fuel is our venture capital practice uh, and the objective that we have uh, is to help uh, startup in their next uh, uh, growth curve and help uh, venture capital firms. So we want to be there and uh, shape the shapers. That's the passion of people that do Fuel and we are very excited about uh, uh, the work that we do together with our clients. I would like to welcome today, and the focus of today's session will be on uh, designing for customer centricity in the travel and hospitality industry. And I'm very glad that you are all here today. And I will now give the word to Anna, that will be our moderator today. And uh, I hope you will have all a great session. Thank you again for joining. Thank you, Massimo. My name is Anna Kronschnabel and I'm an associate partner with McKinsey in the New Jersey office. And I spend all my time helping consumer companies create winning and engaging experiences for their customers. And I'm very excited to be moderating this panel today. Before we get started, we thought it would be good to ground us in a bit of research on human-centered design and the recent shifts that we saw in consumer sentiment and behaviors. So, why does designing for customer centricity actually matter? We studied over 300 companies over the duration of five years and recorded over 100,000 different design actions and in parallel collected financial performance data. And when we looked at that data together, we actually found that design focused companies outperformed their industry peers on 35% in revenue and 56% in total returns to shareholders. And this held true for both product and for services industries. Some of the key findings that we had were that companies that make the user experience everyone's responsibility are more successful than companies who continue working in silos. We also found that successful companies de-risk development of new experiences by continuously testing with their consumers and their end users. And lastly, we found that when companies think about experience holistically and they take down the barriers between physical design, digital design, and service design, that is what really increases their performance. COVID-19 has changed consumer behavior and sentiments, which is creating new opportunities to design for customer centricity. And so let's look a little bit at some of the changes that we've seen. There are five key ways that COVID-19 has affected consumer behaviors, many of which will have a lasting impact. And we'll talk about many of these later on in our panel conversation. The first thing we saw is that consumers place more emphasis on value and essentials. They've been evaluating more carefully where they spend and they are spending more on essential items. The second thing we've seen is a very big increase in usage of digital and omni-channel offerings. Digital spend penetration, online spend penetration has increased by 35% since the beginning of the pandemic. And consumers are telling us that they expect to continue shifting more of their spend to online and digital channels. The third thing we saw is that consumers have tried new brands and have changed loyalties. 75% of consumers actually tried different stores, websites, or brands since the beginning of the pandemic. And we also saw on that digital channel that 60% of consumers actually used inspiration from digital channels as they were changing and trying new brands. Very unsurprisingly, the fourth thing we saw is that consumers focused more on health measures being implement implemented. They were actively looking for safety measures, not just for customers, but also for employees to keep everyone safe. And then last but not least, we saw a big increase in the at-home activities. And actually 28% of consumers have invested in new uses of their living space at home. We didn't just look at what are the consumer behaviors that we saw change. We actually also looked at what of those behaviors are likely to stick around? And so what you see on this page is on the y-axis, the degree to which consumer behaviors have shifted during COVID-19. And on the x-axis, the consumer intent to continue with these behaviors after the pandemic. And so if we look at that top right quadrant, which is called fast accelerators, 
those are behaviors that saw very rapid growth during the pandemic and where consumers intend to continue using them. Behaviors that are in here are online shopping growth with some consumers telling us they plan to shift to completely online app usage, buy online, pick up and store, all behaviors that sit in the top right quadrant. The lower right quadrant is the potential to stick behaviors. Those are behaviors that saw moderate growth during COVID-19, and they also have a high intent from consumers to continue using them. In here, examples are online fitness, with more than 50% of consumers telling us that they want to continue with the health habits that they developed during the pandemic. Contactless services are in here, such as self-checkout, drive-through, and then also the continuous usage of the new brands that were tried during the pandemic. On the top left, the quadrant that we have are behaviors that saw high growth during the pandemic, but a lower intent to continue using them after the pandemic. Examples here are personal care at home, video chats, telemedicine would be another one. And then on the lower left, the quadrant is consumer sentiment and behaviors that will likely return to pre-COVID-19 levels. Here, an example would be remote learning for children, but also for adults. So what do these consumer sentiment changes mean for businesses, and in particular, when we design for customer centricity? First off, let me just start by saying that COVID-19 is first and foremost a global humanitarian challenge, and solving it is, of course, priority number one. And then it's about safeguarding our livelihoods and creating physically safe experiences. And so designing for this physical safety, we've all seen many examples of companies doing that, such as increasing hygiene protocols, requirements for staff and customers to wear masks. The second step is then, how do you design for psychological safety? How do we assure some of the customers that are still anxious about returning to physical spaces that they're safe? Examples here, are airlines that are proactively communicating before trips about the additional safety precautions and hygiene measures that they're taking. That is creating emotional safety for customers. And then the third step would be, how do we now design distinctive experiences after we have taken care of physical safety and, and psychological safety? And here, the first thing is, let's meet the consumer's needs understanding their changed needs and creating solutions that are not just safer, but that are actually better. Building on trends that we already saw, such as the shift to digital, giving consumers a choice on which channels they want to engage with us, for example. The second thing here is to be human and empathetic and in your design, actually staying true to your company's purpose and values and caring about your employees and the communities that you engage in. And then lastly, being willing to change rapidly. We're seeing that the environment is changing very, very quickly. And so companies need to be able to adapt similarly quickly. And so moving to how do you generate consumer insights very rapidly and set up a different way of working with cross-functional teams that are enabled to take decisions very quickly, put them into action, rapidly ideate, pilot, and test. And it's it's really a, a very different um, working model. And we'll talk about that a little bit with our panelists. For example, Hyatt, in three weeks, stood up a completely new offering called Office for a Day. And so they went from having the idea to being in the market with this new offering in just three weeks. And with that, I'm very excited to move over to our panelists. Welcome. We're excited to get started with our panel now. Um, we'll get started with a quick round of introductions of our panelists. And we'll start with Raj, if you could please tell us a little bit about your background and your company. Hello, everybody. My name is Raj Singh. I run investing for JetBlue Technology Ventures. My background is uh, grew up in the UK, um, mostly focused on computer science and consulting for many years uh, and then moved to the dark side, the venture capital, primarily investing in startups that are related to the travel, transportation and hospitality industries. Very pleased to be here today, thank you. 
Thank you, Raj. Joel. Hi, guys. I'm Joel Spiro. I am an Australian living in Argentina. I am the head of product at Rappi for their new vertical travel. Uh, for those that don't know, Rappi is a multi-vertical regional super app in Latin America, uh, similar to what a Might One would be for Asia. Uh, it started as a delivery app for, for restaurants, grew with different verticals and added uh, travel to the mix, to its ecosystem with its payment model. Um, and hopefully I bring to the table today a interesting perspective from all the different hats that I've worn over the years from a, a very technical orientated design approach all the way to owning a business in Latin America and all the craziness and particularities that that involves. Thank you, Joel. Melissa. Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa. I'm a partner at McKinsey, and I focus on design and customer experience. So the topic today is near and dear to my heart. I work a lot in travel and hospitality, uh, both for uh, large companies struggling with what happened over the last year, as well as with companies building new businesses really in, in this context. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Melissa. And last but not least, Liz. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I am the Vice President of Guest Experience Strategy and Innovation at Hyatt. Uh, Hyatt is a leading global hospitality company. We offer 20 premium brands in 69 countries uh, in six continents um, or across six continents. My, my team is primarily responsible for connecting the dots between the entire guest journey. Um, so sort of as you think about, um, in many cases, moving from a digital booking process through to sort of experiencing um, our hotels and our individual brands. Um, so that digital to physical um, connection point. Uh, and we also oversee our loyalty program strategies so that we can drive repeat visits from our guests. Excited to be here. Thank you, Liz. Uh, we have a few questions for our panelists prepared to start of the conversation, and we have time at the end for Q&A. So please feel free to submit your questions in the chat box, and we'll make a selection um, of those for the panelists. So to get us started, Melissa, I'd love to start with you and understand from you, what are some of the key issues that your McKinsey clients have grappled with coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic related to customer-centric design? What are the, the key things that they have sort of thought about and come, come to you for? I love that you said coming out of the pandemic. I think we all have our fingers crossed there. Um, <clears throat> it's a great question. And I think, um, you know, all, all of the folks on this panel will, will have really interesting stories about how they've addressed it. What, what we've seen more broadly, obviously started with the safety question, right? As you laid out, I think in your intro, everybody had to solve for safety quickly as well as solve for what was happening with their own employees, right? And, and their ability to sort of stay afloat up front. But quickly, I think as people started realizing we were riding this out for a while, maybe say early in the fall, we started seeing a lot more interest in, okay, we are gonna need to sort of redefine our value proposition to some extent, whether it's serving different people, serving them differently, um, something would have to change. That's pretty difficult in a situation with limited funds, right? With limited funds, limited ability. And so what we saw probably boiled down to a couple of key points. One was the type of agility that people had in terms of saying, hey, we wanna experiment with new elements that we wanna to bring to customers. It went through the roof, right? So stuff that we saw mostly in product, right? In Joel's world actually started to go into the main body of, of most of our clients, right? We got to meet quickly. We got to make decisions without a ton of evidence of, of whether they're going to work and we got to be prepared to iterate. So the agility that we've seen happen sort of across the spectrum certainly happened here as well. And then we saw uh, an increased desire to talk to customers. What did they need? And in interesting cases, it wasn't what it was before. So um, I serve an events ticketing platform um, and they of course weren't getting to be able to put tickets um, out there for sale, right? There wasn't anything to do. And what they quickly realized was that parts of their journey and their experience had changed in terms of what people cared. And instead of just being a ticketing events platform, they needed to have things like a return policy that they hadn't had before, right? So a very different piece of the customer experience became important to them and they needed to iterate. That became actually something they could then offer to customers. Their ability to address that allowed them to then offer to customers an ability to say, hey, we know what the return policy is for us, but also we will start to collate what the return policies are for events and venues and things like that. So they served the industry in a really different way. And I think that iteration and customer needs sort of focus is gonna be um, imperative as we sort of see the loyalty shock you talked about. 
Yeah. Thank you, Melissa. I'm actually curious, Liz, maybe from your perspective for Hyatt, right? Your industry has been severely impacted by the pandemic and the subsequent lockdowns. And maybe can you talk a little bit about how have you tackled these challenges? How have you evolved your customer experience strategy as the pandemic continued? And, you know, how have you leveraged human centric design, empathy in your approach? Melissa just talked about, you know, learning more about your customer. Absolutely. Um, to start, Hyatt has, um, we're grounded in listening. So our purpose overall is to care for people so they can be their best. So we knew right away we needed to focus on driving and living up to our purpose um, in really understanding what was happening um, very quickly. Um, our The hotel industry is very complex. Um, we have ownership. We have different management models. We have a mix of B2B and B2C customers. So we had to listen and learn really fast. Um, we tend to focus on our four key stakeholder groups, our owners, our customers, um, which is more of our B2B audience, our colleagues, and our guests. Um, and the pandemic really impacted all of these audiences. Um, but this pandemic has been like really no other recession. Um, it's been more emotional for everyone as we can all understand. And, um, you know, early on we were closing hotels. This is something, you know, we've really never experienced even in deep other difficult recessions. We were furloughing employees. Um, we were fielding frantic calls from guests. We were getting group cancellations. Um, so we were really seeking to understand what was happening um, and what we needed to do first. So for the purpose of this question, I'm going to focus on our colleagues and our guests, um, but by no means um, <laughs> ignore our other stakeholders in this. But for our colleagues, you know, we learned that they needed to really feel confidence in our care for their well-being and safety. Um, so we developed our global care and cleanliness commitment in April. So that was just in a few short weeks. Um, and we established an approach where we had hygiene managers in every one of our hotels around the world, which is, is a role that we um, continue today. They're responsible for making sure we had great cleaning processes um, that we were um, applying for and receiving GVAC stars, facility ratings um, for all of our hotels around the world. Um, and really kind of thinking about what cleanliness meant for our colleagues as well as for our guests. So do we do some of the, um, you know, hygiene theater that you may have heard about, like bringing our overnight cleaning of the lobbies and things that we used to do sort of behind the scenes to the forefront so that people could feel that confidence as they returned to, to our hotels. And when I think about our guests, um, very similarly, you know, we were looking at surveys that were coming in for those that were still traveling. We were listening in our global contact centers. And probably most importantly, we were having tremendous dialogue with our online travel community. This is a group of people around the world um, that really are engaged with us and give us feedback um, in everything that we do. But we leaned in here really hard this year. Um, and sort of the arc of emotions um, for these guests has really driven everything that we do. Initially, again, it was about reassurance, flexibility. Um, we launched a Headspace partnership in our app um, to really try to take care of that well-being side of things um, when uh, you know our, our members weren't traveling with us. So how could we help care for them um, when they weren't with us? The summer brought more confidence in travel, um, though we did, again, from the travel community, learn that people were now willing to drive up to eight hours to go on vacation. So how could we change our digital targeting um, to broaden the potential, um, you know, escapes for those people? And then finally, as you mentioned um, in your uh, lead in, um, you know, as as the fall came about, we were seeing people um, think differently about sort of that return to work, return to school. You know, that's always a difficult time for people, um, sort of a depressing time, it's getting colder. But now we were seeing surges um, in the pandemic. But we also realized that school was not the same school that you were returning to. We all were not, you know, tethered to a workplace. So how could we capitalize on that um, and that new sort of need state? Um, and so we developed, as you mentioned, um, some work from Hyatt packages. So WFH, work from home, we changed that to work from Hyatt and established extended stay packages so that people could um, be set up with laundry service, 
um, extended rates, F&B discounts, um, as well as you mentioned office for the day. So allowing people to, you know, get out of their home life if they needed to have a quiet place to work and be productive. Um, so we've seen tremendous success in that, but really it's, it's, it, it came to life, as you said, in three weeks, which um, for those who have worked in massive corporations, that is like lightning speed. Um, but really from concept to getting the hotels on board um, and really getting the word out, um, you know, we were able to really feel like we could be supportive of driving business into our hotels. That's great. Thank you, Liz. Joel, I'm curious for you guys, you at Drapi started the travel vertical, I think, just before the pandemic hit. And so uh, obviously a challenging time. Right? Or, or not, but uh, we were about to launch a big camp marketing campaign. I think it was in uh, in February uh, yes. and we were about to pull the trigger. And, and uh, thankfully, I guess, because you, know, you don't want to be putting a big marketing campaign in the launch just as the pandemic hits and, and restrictions come in. Uh, we were able to sort of guard that and and do a bit of a pivot more towards um, you know customer uh, development, product development, and and ensuring that you know we're we're doing a lot of things that you know, being a an agency or an intermediary or a marketplace, um, you have to try and be in front of all of these providers that are providing these services. So a lot of what uh, Elizabeth was talking about with you know, same day stays at a hotel, that's not something that typically people are, are buying online or know about. So there's a lot of responsibility to, to be doing uh, the awareness of those particular things, but also the plumbing that needs to be involved to get that done. Um, but uh, overall, to be honest, I don't think that at Rappi, um, the customer experience strategy itself it changed very much. Rappi was born as a very, very customer-centric model, very customer-centric culture. Uh, one of our main sort of like principles is, you know, to deliver magic uh, to the customers. And I think in every single product decision that we do, it's always, you know, how are you building, you know, what value you're adding? Um, how, how does this fit into the overall uh, success of the customer in using it? Um, one of our very big indicators in our OKRs is the NPS score. We put a very heavy focus on net promoter score um, and very specifically uh, in the detractor part of that. So, you know, clustering detractor uh, commenting, uh, commentary and finding sort of trends within that, even at a manual level, like going through all of that and clustering it and then putting really strong initiatives uh, around that. Um, but I think something really, really particular about Rappi is that given that it's multi-vertical, uh, not all verticals will happen at the same time. So Melissa was talking about uh, she worked with an events company. Rappi had an events module. Uh, it was building up to its traditional super app appeal where it's going to have everything uh, and, and travels the glue that, you know, you go to, to an event, you have the mobility, you have the scooter, you have this, you get the takeaway. That, right? And the whole experience is your end-to-end -end travel sort of itinerary. Um, and then you have a pandemic that says, all right, travel, no, mobility, no. So uh, things start flying. But at the same time, on the other end of this spectrum, it's, you know, Rappi is or was and still is very, very well positioned to provide an amazing service, a fundamental service uh, for a lot of these countries where you have to stay at home. You're not allowed to leave. And uh, it brought a lot of people into a new channel. So there were a lot of people, grandparents or people that were helping grandparents remotely because they couldn't see them, try and get online where their first digital experience was Rappi and the convenience that that showed. So what we had as a group, we were like, all right, travel. Rappi's helped people stay at home. Now we have to help them as Rappi and everything that that entails, all the convenience, the flexibility, the spontaneity, uh, the empowerment that that gives you of seeing where that guy is walking around you know, and coming to your house. How can we translate that to help you get out of your house? And uh, very specifically, two things that come to mind. One thing we we're talking about your pivots, Elizabeth, like how do we provide new products? What happens with our partners, for example, when they can't use their loyalty system when the planes are ground? Uh, so we pivoted part of our development to, to do uh, integrations for these pr uh, platforms to allow them to be a currency within Rappi. So now in, in Colombia, many, many people use their life miles to actually pay for hamburgers or to do their shopping, um, where at the beginning it was like, mm, is this going to work, whatever. And then you see like, as people go, okay, hold on, 
I'm not going to be traveling for two years, three. Well, I don't know what it is. My points are going to expire. How do I remain relevant as a program for, for these programs, but also from a user? How do I use these points that really are meaningless right now for me? So that was a big pivot that we did. But more sustainable is flexibility and changes. And specifically, a use case that we're seeing now that I think nobody would have imagined is uh, having changes with residual value. Uh, what does that specifically mean? I make a change. Normally, if I made a change, typically, I'd be going maybe to the same place. I need to make a small change. And as you get closer to the fair, it would be more expensive. Uh, there would also be, to disincentivize that, a change fee. But now you have flexible change fee. And you have people that one day wake up and say, oh, remember that trip to Miami? The borders are closed. You can't go. And you're already in a really frustrated and terrible situation. You're like, OK, I now need to call the call center because I'm going to, instead of using uh, this to go somewhere else, which costs more or less the same, whatever, I'm going to do a domestic or a regional travel. And it's way cheaper. And right now, there are no mature processes in place between the airline uh, and, the, and, uh, and the user to actually do that online. So that's something where we put a lot of effort. And in the app right now, you can make those changes. You can use those credits. You can say, hey, I want this and issue a voucher at the airline. So uh, these are things that we looked at. What are those frustrations? What are those points? And where can we facilitate that and provide that wow experience for the client where they would normally be like, oh, this is terrible. We're going to make it better. I think that's a really great segue into a question I had for Raj. Joel, you talked a lot about using digital as a way to de-friction, right? The experience for uh, customers and your consumers. And Raj, I'd be curious, how do you see innovation and technology unlock improving the customer experience, in particular in the travel industry in this current environment? Yeah, it's uh, honestly a question which the whole industry has been grappling with even before the pandemic. Um, you know, I think Elizabeth alluded to it. It's a very complicated business. And uh, the other side is that we have systems that are primarily quite old. And so um, bringing them into the experience that somebody like Joel and Rappi might provide, uh, or uh, let's say the social media platforms might provide, has been very difficult. And so what the pandemic has done um, and the demand shock that it produced uh, has created is a desire to fast forward that. How can we quickly move to a point where we can make the customer experience better. Um, uh, and uh, that really starts with you know, the online experience since most people now are looking online either directly at the airline's uh, website or uh, at an OTA to decide where it is they want to travel. And we've had lots of stories over the years about how many websites and how much time it takes to do that. Um, oddly enough, uh, people actually enjoy doing some of that. So it's not the case that they don't want to do any of it because they feel like they're in control of their choices and the pricing by making comparisons and looking around. So it's not the case that all goes away, but it does, it is the case that it needs to be clearer and more simple. And that, you know, we, if you've ever been on a JetBlue flight, um, you know, the uh, just before takeoff, the uh, flight attendant will say, sit back, relax, and enjoy the JetBlue experience, not the JetBlue flight, the JetBlue experience. And so, the way that we've been approaching it is how do we bring the JetBlue experience, which for us connotes um, a good experience, good customer service, a willingness to try and do things, um, how do we bring that to the entire journey, not just the flight? And so that starts then with the digital experience. And um, what we do at JetBlue is that, you know, we have obviously teams internally who work on that on a daily basis, trying to improve what we're doing. But then my group, our role is to look outside of the organization and find other companies, primarily startups, who are doing something different and radical that we haven't perhaps considered, that we might be able to add on to the experience in order to produce something that's quantifiably better for our customers uh, and for our crew members. So that's, that's how we describe our, us as employees. So this is really what's happened. Um, it's fast forwarded that. Um, it's been very, very tricky as somebody that invests in startups because um, what's happened is that um, there's been a flight to safety. So um, a lot of people have invested in very large travel startups, ones that have already raised hundreds of millions of dollars, um, uh, reckoning that the pandemic will have depressed valuations, but that those companies are unlikely to go out of business. Um, but for the other guys, the new startups, the smaller startups, the ones that hadn't yet um, achieve traction, it's been a really difficult time. 
Um, and honestly, in the US at least, the, uh, the PPP program that has been um, enabling people to pay employees, perhaps at a reduced rate, uh, through government loans that can be forgiven in part, has been a life uh, saver for a lot of people. And uh, so we do see that a lot of areas like, uh, I think it was mentioned, you know, um, uh, hygiene um, and uh, the ability to ch be much more flexible about how you do pricing, all of that stuff is going to roll forward into the future. It will become business as usual. You probably won't get any points for doing that, but it will have to be there. Um, and then the question then becomes, once people are ready to travel again, how will you entice them back to travel with you? Um, there will be a shift in people's travel patterns. So perhaps people might go for those eight hour drives um, as opposed to taking a plane. Um, they, might, they might go camping instead of going to a hotel, right? So how do we understand what will happen there? Um, and in particular, I think for the airline industry, um, how do we understand what happens with business travelers? So JetBlue is a, uh, mostly a leisure airline, uh, but yet we still have business travelers. But for most of the industry, um, the business travelers power the profit. And so if those people are not traveling, um, how do we change our business model to make sure that everything still works well? Um, and it will be you know, actually very interesting. And um, hat tip to McKinsey, some interesting reports that came out from you guys about how you think business travel will evolve depending on the role of the person and also depending on where their customers might be because they might not be at work, they might not be at an office, they might be at home, they might be in a satellite office, they might be at a Hyatt or a WeWork, wherever it might be. Um, and so how does that evolve? And that's something, honestly, I don't think we know the answer to, but what's exciting is that there are a number of startups that are iterating around that. So there's optionality that we can work with to say, well, look, these are the likely things that might happen. Let's invest, let's learn. And then when we find a signal that says, this is the direction we're going, that's when we jump in. That's great, Raj. Thank you so much. It was actually one of the questions I wanted to ask next is, we know that there are some behaviors that might stick. We don't know exactly what behaviors will stick. And um, was curious, maybe Liz, you can talk a little bit through, you know, we're expecting for sure that the shift to digital will continue to stay. And there's probably other behaviors that you think will continue uh, to be around. And so how are you at Hyatt thinking about um, preparing for that? What are what are the ways that you guys are either anticipating or designing for the uncertainty, if you want? Yeah, it's interesting. And, and Raj, I hope they're at Hyatt. Um, we do, we do um, are seeing that shift to leisure business, um, you know, obviously for the near term, you know, and really into the next couple of years. Um, this is an area where we can't really um, listen to understand what will happen. Customer behavior is is a bit finicky and, and, and we are you know, trying to keep as much of a pulse on it as we can. But even headed into the, or before the pandemic, you know, we were focused and, and remain focused on really driving our technology solutions. Um, we know that control for guests is really important. So not only in that um, booking process, as both Joel and Raj mentioned, but also, you know, in the actual experience itself. Um, so how can we take a look at enhancing that in ways that still stay true to who we are? How do we bring care to life in a digital way? Um, we, you know, as the pandemic hit, um, we had fewer people, unfortunately, 40% fewer people to tackle some of these things. We were in sort of a keep the lights on mode. Um, but we also needed to figure out, you know, um, with some precision where we focus. And we knew that focusing in on our, our mobile app technology was somewhere where we we really wanted to go. So we launched things like enhanced check-in, um, which again, delivers on that flexibility, control, um, reassurance to our members that they've received an upgrade. It allows them the decision of whether they want housekeeping in their room or not, and how often. Um, digital dining, um, things like bringing to life QR codes for our mobile menus, um, payment solutions, knock and go room service, and sort of that, that freedom and flexibility to dine wherever they want in our hotels. So we, um, while we obviously accelerated this work um, throughout um, the last year, we really know that that investment is going to be worth it in the long haul. And as, as we've talked to 
to guests and we've asked them, what do you think will stick? It's really interesting to hear their answers. Their focus on well-being, as you spoke about in the intro, is going to remain crucial. So how do we deliver on that across the experience? Um, hybrid meetings, um, you know, we're going to continue to see corporations need to meet in person, but maybe not everybody can be there. So what does that solution look like? How can we identify the right um, levels of support for both the planner, um, attendees, and speakers. Um, so, you know, we're we're definitely keeping a pulse on it, but also kind of taking that long-term view of if we're not going to see corporate return right away, we're slowly seeing group build back. How can we continue to ensure we're delivering for the leisure guest, um, and then investing in technologies that we believe in the long run uh, will support that ever-changing consumer behavior um, that we all expect to see uh, globally. Thank you, Liz. This is just a reminder that if you have any questions, Q&A for the panel, please put it in the bottom in the chat box so that we can take those. Joel, would love to also hear from you, you know, much more of a startup culture. How are you guys thinking about, you know, designing for the uncertainty and behaviors that might stick? Well, I'll break that up into two parts. So uncertainty is an important factor there, uh, and then we'll talk about behaviors. But uh, uncertainty is something that um, I, I think we'll talk about this before. Oh, we're about to get out of the uh, out of the pandemic, uh, and we really don't know. Like that, that's the reality. Like in Argentina, right here, we're about to go into further restrictions. Uh, Colombia was turned off effectively, full restrictions over the weekend. Um, so. You know, it's very cyclical. And one of the impacts of that is, is how did, from a marketing perspective as well, how do you start and stop? How do you start and stop? Like what's the, you know, you have to be a lot more agile as a company to be able to react to this. Whereas, you know, you'd be making plans, you'd have a budget. I, I mentioned, you know, we're about to do a campaign, whatever. And then all of a sudden you're like, what do you do? Now that's happening in a micro level. Like, you know, do I push this, this thing that is going to be a really cool getaway um or hold on wait no but now they can't get out what should we do okay now we're, hold on let's counter with that with um with a better deal on on prime which is a subscription service for delivery so it's a balancing act and you've got to be really nimble um and that would be from the uncertainty point of view uh and from a behavioral point of view i think there are some things that i i hope personally that they remain uh, for example flexibility i think that's an amazing advancement that has happened in travel uh, travel was always one of the very first uh, electronic, let's say, distribution systems where there was a lot of integration. But it also means that it becomes quite uh, fragile as you move forward. So, like, you might miss a paradigm uh, for technology. Uh, and you get something like Amazon or whatnot where people are Zappos and they're used to, like, here, send me shoes, I'll send them back. And they're like, whoa, that's insane. Oh, I bought a ticket. Oh, no, you can't do anything with that. So it's like, you know, that used to be a space that was horrible. And now it's like, I live with that every day. Like, how is that a horrible thing? So, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to make these processes much more mature between companies. And that's, you know, where a lot of it's going to be. But the consumer is going to demand that flexibility. And if they start making it more and more restrictive, they might see an opportunity for airlines that say, you know what, I'm going to stay with this little flexibility tone. I'm going to play with this and differentiate myself from the other airlines. And where airlines are looking at branded fares and looking to differentiate themselves, and I'm focusing on airlines, uh, but it happens with brands and hotels and whatnot. Uh, that's a really great way to, to decommoditize yourself. And I think that's going to be uh, done. The second one is advanced purchasing. So we're seeing you know, a lot of people you know, with uncertainty, and that's very linked to that. Uh, I'm not making a plan for six. I go to Australia every year in summer, and I have no idea if I can go. I get asked, are you coming to Australia? And I'm like, I have no idea. Uh, I can't make plans, uh, but maybe if you ask me, what am I doing this weekend? I'd be more available to say, okay, you know what? I'll book for that. So you're seeing a shortening of the advanced purchase window. That might disappear, but I think it won't disappear totally in the sense that like everything is not going to be black and white. It's not, we're going to go full remote office versus full everyone in the office. We're not going to go online education and not like my kids you know, they had a horror, you know, it was Zoom, it was terrible, whatever. Now they're back at school, but they're not always just back at school. All of a sudden, they have a hybrid platform that accompanies them from a digital point of view. So we're seeing a mix of channels, and that's going to happen as well with advanced purchase. You're getting people that are like, hey, I can do that eight-hour drive. Oh, yeah, I'll do that. And the frequency and the touch points will, will, will come a lot more than what used to be maybe once a year that we interact with these brands. 
and that blend will start sort of becoming a lot more blended and not so extreme. So they're things that we're looking at, um, flexibility, spontaneity, and above all, unfortunately, this is like a bit of a Debbie Downer, but uh, I think a big word to wrap up what's happening right now is disparity, and it's going to get worse and worse. Uh, what does that mean and why you have to focus on it? Um, I, you know, Latin America is very different to Asia. It's very different to America. Even within Latin America, everything's very different. Um, and as you see some, com uh, some countries get a control of the pandemic, you also see co some countries that are really suffering with controlling that. So what we might have saw in the last few years of like a, almost like a gentrification of the experience of like a global, like everything almost looks the same. I don't know, the designers went on to dribble and just copied whatever the new design is. Um, and everyone's copying each other. Uh, I think, you know, you look at some, I look at some of the Chinese things and I, I, I just don't understand. I don't understand what's going on. Like, how, why are they doing that? But it makes a lot of sense in their market. And that is going to happen more and more to all of these online companies where it's like, okay, we're no longer just copying that. We have to localize because the consumer is so different. They're living in such a different context now than an American who's, you know, on the top of the way going, yeah, we're about to leave and let's, I want to travel everywhere to I'm going back to restrictions. So that's something from a regional perspective that's going to become a big, big factor in how we, we assign resources and design stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joel. This is actually a great segue into one of the questions we got from the audience, uh, you know, with you saying consumer preferences, right? Needs will vary much, much more locally. And so the question is, what different sources of insights have you used internally and externally over the past year? And I wonder, actually, Melissa, if you could get uh, us started on that, since you have seen that, right, with your various different clients on, on what they use. Yeah, I mean, sort of across the board, right, in terms of what we're seeing, you know, there's, there's definitely a desire for um, large scale data where it's available, right? To just be able to predict the major changes and the major sticking things that are coming. On the other hand, I think it's just rapid waves, right? Uh, I like Liz's example of having a panel you can go to on a frequent basis. Um, I'm seeing folks actually just have customers in every week, two weeks and just talk to them. Um, so I do think there's a mix right now for sure of both the sort of qualitative ability to just have conversations and see what's happening one-on-one uh, -on -one, as well as those large scale data sets to just track. Um, there's not a ton of, you know, investment, right, available for this. So I think being clear on the fact that you know what is going to matter, and as Joel said very eloquently, being nimble about how to react to that um, is just critical, right? And, and I think uh, the mix of types of, of quant and quala are critical to being able to sort of feel comfortable where you're investing. Thank you, Melissa. Anyone else from the panel have a few thoughts on types of sources that you've tapped? Maybe Melissa in this nimble and agile fashion. Um, I'm happy to jump in just for a minute. Um, I think, you know, early on, as I mentioned, our stakeholders, um, it was really important for us to help owners make decisions, key critical decisions about what they were going to do with their hotels. Are they going to open? Are they going to stay closed? And so we, um, you know, have always had transparent um, and really good partnerships with our owners. That's one of the good things about being the smaller of the big guys. Um, and what we, um, you know, really tried to help them understand is, you know, what was happening when you look at like TSA numbers, what's happening when you're looking at like IATA, num uh, IATA travel, where are people flying into um, and sort of keeping a pulse on that, but also looking at our own data. Um, you know, one of the interesting things we noticed is that we were seeing more bookings going direct to our hotels. Um, and that was people had questions. Is the pool going to be open? Are your restaurants open? Now, the unfortunate thing is that our hotels are extremely understaffed right now. So they don't have time for those phone calls. So how could we help them in bumping those calls to the global contact centers, making sure our global contact centers were equipped to answer those questions and also leaning in from like a, a, a digital technology perspective and making sure, you know, all that information was updated real time. I think that has been one of the hardest things about this pandemic is people don't know where to go. They don't know who to trust. They don't know what information is reliable or updated. So I think it's that blend of, you know, outside sources as well as looking differently at the data that you have to identify um, those problems. And are we setting good enough expectations um, to make sure we're delivering on our experiences? 
Um, my comment would be that, uh, you know, what's, what I've observed is that the uh, global supply chain kind of fell apart at the start. If you remember, everybody scrambling for toilet paper and things like this. Um, uh, it, was, uh, it was surprising to me that, that we had those shortages. And what I think I've understood is that a lot of our large businesses in, in travel in particular, we've built for execution. The margins are not always the highest in our industry. And so, you know, we're very concerned to make sure that we can profitably serve our customers. Uh, I think the world will change a little bit. And, you know, bringing, uh, looking at points that Joel brought up as well as Liz and Melissa, um, you know, the customer is going to be more variable in their demand. That requires me to have redundancy. I need to be able to offer different sorts of things at different times very quickly. Um, likewise, my supply chain will also be more variable. I believe that over time, this thing does settle down into a new norm. Um, and that new norm itself will be disrupted again when the next thing happens or five years down the line. But for now, we'll get to a new norm, norm where that norm is less on execution per se and more on ensuring I have the redundant other elements that I can change course rapidly when I need to. So I might sacrifice some short-term profitability uh, with the goal of being more resilient um, when things change. And then the other thing I would say is that, uh, you know, Melissa mentioned um, looking at data. I think, you know, the way that good companies do this is that they combine their vision. What is their, what is their role in the world? Why are they here? Um, you know, in the case of JetBlue, we talk about inspiring humanity and brightening the journey. Um, so how do I do that? And how do I do that in a way which is relevant to today? And the way that you do that, I think, is that you look at the data, as Melissa mentioned, but actually you need to look at the data in real time. So, you know, we've moved from a world where we didn't have the data and we used our guts. Now we have data, but often that data is outdated or incomplete. And so now where I think we need to head is we have data and we need to be able to examine it in real time and derive insights in near real time in order to be able to guide the business um, in a more flexible manner. So I think that's something which is an underlying trend that will continue regardless of how you know, the pandemic plays out and uh, you know, how customer preferences change. And I hope you don't mind if I jump in on that. You know, Raj, I couldn't vehemently agree with you anymore. Um, I think one of the more, and I'd be curious to hear from the rest of you what you think, but one of the more complex things I think we face moving forward as people who think about customer experience is really the sheer amount of data <laughs> that we have, right? And, and the fact that it needs to be both responsive or also predictive, right? Maybe and or. Um, and that is a very different way of interacting with customers than we've ever really been able to do before. We all saw it coming with digital because we could collect it. But now we're, we have lots of ways, right? Operationally, we can track behavior, you know, outside data, we can track, etc. How do you all think through how to look at that data, uh, those data, how to react to it quickly without sort of going nuts, really, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a flood of data. How do you make meaning and decide what to work on and prioritize? That's to Joel. I mean, yeah. I was, I, I, I'm a, an information architect, so uh, we're playing in my wheelhouse here. Uh, I, I love the question, and uh, I'm, I'm a, a very heavily skewed towards uh, a lot of data analytics and, and capturing as, those signals and then uh, structuring it. Uh, I think that um, a lot of people, even if the information is there, they don't know how to get to it as well, or they don't want to get to it. And I think there's no excuse anymore um to to not get to it and to not be able to play with data uh, i i like to teach that's something i like to do and one of the things that i've been doing lately is doing a lot of sessions on our analytics um getting people to know how to build their own analytics um it's something that the first thing i tell to somebody is you know if you don't know how to pull an sql query from the database and you're doing QA or support or whatnot, you're at a very serious disadvantage because that's a very powerful tool to have that information. Well, you no longer have to do that anymore. Uh, a lot of people like myself has done the work to have those signals go up to a, a solution that it might be uh, Google, An Google Analytics, Amplitude or whatnot, uh, where today it's really a click and drag and it's a beautiful experience. Um, but you have to understand things like, you know, what dimension you're cutting the data with segmentation, funnel, etc. I think, again, it's wanting to see it. There's no excuse why you can't do it yourself and get that real time 
uh, insights that Raj was talking about, um, that's there. It's a no-brainer. Uh, but you need to have that core focus. Everything needs to be with that in your back in the background. Whoa, are we doing the analytics? What is the objective that we're measuring with this? Like, don't just do everything. Like, let's be smart. What do we want to achieve and work backwards? And then start using those points, and you'll find a much, much richer environment of metrics for you to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. Joel, Thank you, I would, Joel. Oh. Sorry, go ahead, Liz. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just, I would just add, and um, you know, I love the fact that you're doing, uh, you know, educational sessions with with teams. We're taking a similar approach in the sense of, you know, more democratization of data. Mm -hmm. So again, same principle applies where, you know, we don't have a lot of money to invest right now, but being um, deliberate in what will make the most long-term sense. And I think as we can all appreciate, the pandemic has um, you know, really affected people differently um, and regionally. So we needed to make sure that our data that it typically is housed centrally was getting out to the region so that they could be making their own decisions real time, um, affecting the business that was actually happening where they are. So I think it is a really important point that we can't all be information architects. Um, we may not want to be, um, but you know we do need to know enough to make sound good decisions. And I think one thing, as I mentioned earlier, that that the recovery has done for our business is we are working differently. We are bringing together leaders in the organization, you know, weekly. Um, not to say we weren't talking before, but now the conversation is different. It, it starts with data. It starts with um, insights. And we make sure that we're, you know, getting that word out to operators, getting that word out to our digital teams, out to our salespeople to understand these industries are the ones traveling, go after them. Um, you know, I think that's how the conversation has changed and how we've had to take on a more agile approach to running our business. Totally. Thank you, Liz. Um, we had another question from the audience, which uh, sort of relates to the data that we discussed, but in a slightly different way, um, you know, you're all deploying different short term and medium term strategies, right? Uh, what metrics are you using to see if those are actually working? So, you know, I'll, I'll take it if you want. Great. Okay. Thank you. John. Um, well, again, uh, Rappi is a very multi vertical sort of a company. So it's very, very different uh, in terms of every vertical. But uh, obviously, it is a platform that at its core, besides the MPS that I mentioned earlier, um, which is the basis of everything, that, that everything has to fall back into that. Um, and if you're doing something that seems great in the short term, uh, but it's impacting MPS, that's a no-go. Uh, I think Raj was talking about that. That's a definite uh, thing that's going on right now. Um, but in the end of the day, it is GMV. So it's a platform that's, you know, it's an ecosystem of, of, of payments and whatnot. So how much is moving through uh, our, our platform? But at the same time, for different verticals, it means different things. When you have, um, I think it was Melissa that was talking about, you know, you have to be, uh, or sorry, Raj again, he was saying you have to be quite diverse because you have to be more resilient than you are deep. And uh, in the sense, uh, uh, Super app that's multi vertical is a perfect expression of that. Um, you know, at one point, uh, events disappeared, live events came on, travel was this, then travel goes down. Uh, supermarkets, oh, everyone needs their shot. Uh, pharmacy, so it's, it's that blend there. But um, when you're in the cyclical nature of, oh, okay, GMV might not be my measure, NPS is always my measure. So, what initiatives are we doing to reduce those detractors? You know, oh, I had a really, this was frustrating because what are we doing and how do we measure that? How did that, how many times did that statement come in a detractor comment and, and measuring that? And then how many people were net promoters that went through a specific, uh, a specific uh, flow and you can cut that by cohort. So we do different cohort based segmentation to, de to determine our, our um, conversion funnels within different segments. And that's very, very important to us, but always, always cut by MPS. Thank you, Joel. We're coming up on the hour and the conversation is passing very quickly. So I'll, I'll close us out with one more question from the audience that we had, whether 
um, for any of you guys, your strategic vision, if that has shifted through the pandemic, you know, I think broadly one and then specifically anything around customer acquisition versus retention and has that evolved or changed? I would say from a, from a JetBlue perspective, not really. Um, the strategic vision is pretty broad. Um, you know, we want to be uh, um, the best travel provider out there, the one that people think of first when they're thinking of traveling. And um, honestly, that hasn't really changed. Um, I think what we are trying to do is, you know, to the earlier point of resilience and variability, is trying to be more nuanced in the way that we interact with our customers um, so that we are teasing out their specific preferences at a more sort of micro segmentation type of level. But honestly speaking, you know, fortunately, and I think this is how it should be, the strategic vision largely has remained intact because it's something that is, you know, so broad and so overarching that um, short of people deciding they're never going to travel again, you know, it's going to be relevant. So it hasn't really changed. I would agree. Um, you know, we're in the business to care for people. And if nothing else, the last 12 months, we've sort of doubled down there. Um, you know, when you think about um, well-being, um, people's desire to travel, um, our hotel's abilities to service um, all types of guests. Um, fortunately, you know, I think this has been helpful for our teams, regional corporate field teams, hotel teams to really understand that like this, our strategy really, um, as similar to Raj, sort of exp expands into the future. And so it's been helpful for people um, in the organization to see that we wouldn't be making huge strategic shifts based on this. What has changed, getting to your acquisition retention point, um, our, our guest has changed. Um, short term, mid term, maybe even a bit long term, as we think about, you know, the larger um, hotel companies, historically, as we've talked about, are more focused on corporate business versus leisure. Now we're focused on leisure, we're getting better at it. This will be a great skill to have moving forward. And I think differently, or, or similarly to JetBlue, you know, it was sort of a flip, um, you know, we are learning. Um, but at the same time, now we're getting better at sort of and hopefully that will that will help us into the long run. I think where we're critically focused now as travel turns is really on that experience for the guests. Um, how is it different? How can it be the same? How can it be better? Thank you, I'm Liz. Gonna well, I'm going to say something that might be a little bit polemic here, but uh, I think as you go forward, also with the disparity thing that we were talking about earlier, uh, you might get a serious cohort split between those that can travel and those mm -hmm. that can't. And nobody likes a leaky funnel, but at the same time, the idea of spending on cost of acquisition might become a situation that's not as, as attractive as retention, where you see people that have got a much higher frequency sign say, hey, wow, this guy can travel, this guy's traveling, and they tend to travel a lot more than maybe they used to, whereas somebody that might have traveled once or twice can no longer travel or whatnot. And the idea of the cost of acquiring a new person versus, oh my God, these these retain, these people that I can retain, retain and they'll have more frequency and they're traveling a lot more and they're on, on that sort of inequality, let's say, it, it might move the needle towards making a lot more sense to put your focus on retention of, of high value customers, driving your growth, than going out and looking for, for new customers, especially in an environment where like, for example, meta search sites, like, when do you pull your marketing? How do you do it? What's it going to do? What does that impact to whether something is closed off or not? How quick can you be to close that off or not? So are you being efficient in your spend? So it might be easier to look at how can I work with the customers that I do have that are loyal and get the most value out of them and also give them the most value so that it's a no-brainer that they come back to you. Thank you, Joel. Um, we're at the hour, I want to say a very warm Thank you to all of our panelists, Joel, Liz, Raj, Melissa. Thank you for joining us. And I thank you to all of you in our audience who joined us for this uh, talk and panel. And I hope that you found it insightful and that you're taking some good learnings with you into your daily lives. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Anna. Thank, thank you. you.